Hi everyone, welcome to this lecture. I'm going to give a presentation on the transition from 2D to 3D printed electronics. My name is John Harrop and I'm a director of ID TechX. So this slide gives you a little bit of background information about our company. We cover many different areas of study. 3D printing is just one of them. We also cover electric vehicles. We cover uh, printed electronics historically a lot, new wearable technologies. And we're also looking into robotics at the moment and we're always looking for more subjects. We provide a variety of different products and services. We sell reports that we write. So I'm going to be describing this today on the basis of a report which I've completed earlier this year uh, that's now available for sale. Uh, we also provide bespoke consultancy if you want any specific uh, requirements, any problems that you have solved, either technical or market-based, then we can put as many people as necessary on that to get the answers that you need. And finally, we organize events all around the world. So we have uh, three main events coming up I'll mention later. Uh, this is the report that I'm talking about today. So the report includes uh, detailed background information just to set the scene as to where this has come from historically in terms of electronics and circuits. It talks about all of the major players. I'm going to be glossing over some of those today because this is quite a short presentation. It covers all of the technologies that are coming to market and also technologies that are even being used in research that may come to market in the future. It covers all of the different materials that these technologies have been using. So uh, where possible, we have information on market values for major players in some cases. In many cases, these uh, technologies are just embryonic, so we estimate how much, how, how much they're going to be consuming in terms of materials and what kinds of materials they will use. Uh, the book covers 18 different potential applications. In this uh, short presentation, I'm going to be touching on, upon a few of them just to give you some ideas. Um, the book also covers all competing technologies in significant detail. So there is considerable overlap both with incumbent technologies, so traditional PCB etching, for example, uh, but also overlaps with um, emerging technologies, so um, LDS, for example, which I'll mention briefly later on, uh, and also more detailed information on drivers and restraints, so what is driving these markets forward, why do people want to buy these things, what problems do they solve, and also what, what challenges are they facing which is limiting the uptake of these technologies. And finally, the book gives full 10-year market forecasts by sector, so I'm going to be making a, a few brief statements in this presentation about the economic impact of this going forwards. So this slide tells you about our next three upcoming shows. We have November 2015 in Santa Clara, California, I will be at. Uh, we just, just had a Tokyo event uh, in Japan. We've got the next one of those is uh, up in a year's time next year. Uh, we have um, 2016 Berlin, Germany as well for anybody in Europe. So hopefully I, I will meet all of you at one of those events in the future. Please do let me know if you go. I would love to say hi. Uh, so a quick agenda of what I'm going to be covering here. This is a subset of what's in the book. Uh, a review of historical electronics, particularly circuit designs and how circuits have been physically manufactured over the years, over the decades. Uh, the new players, so I'll tell you all of the big names and then I'll give you a short list of some other names that are upcoming companies. Materials options, so what different kinds of materials are people using. What are the potential capabilities? So what might people hope to accomplish using these kinds of technologies in the future? Now, these certainly haven't been realized yet in, in, in most cases. Uh, the challenges, so what, is, what are the main problems that need to be solved for this to really take off? And finally, I'll take a brief look at the economic impact that this is likely to have in the future, and I'll relate back to other subjects that we've covered before and we've seen historically the sort of economic impact that they have and how how these things came to fruition, how they evolved over time. So this slide gives you a very quick idea of the history of printed circuit boards. So on the left-hand side, you have a complete rat's nest where the wires are soldered directly from one component to the other components. Uh, this is all done by hand. This hobbyists still do this today, of course, to some extent, uh, although more and more people actually even manufacture their own PCBs at home now. And basically the entire circuit was shoved into a box. This is clearly not mass producible. This is going to require enormous amounts of slave labor to get this thing uh, into any kind of substantial production volumes. On the right hand side we have a very early printed circuit board. So this is a hand drawn circuit board. You can still see in some classic sort of vintage electronics. So a clue for the vintage there you might recognize some valves in the circuit which we, uh, we don't tend to use these days. So they were commercialized in the 60s, 
uh, invented in the 50s. And now modern PCBs have evolved a long way. They are predominantly multi-layer, two to six layers generally for professional PCBs. The reason is you need the circuit traces to be able to go under and over each other in order to connect essentially any component to any other component. If you only have one layer, then you need some way to jump the tracks, which would normally be a piece of wire soldered in there. And that's no longer seen in professional electronics, which is now almost entirely surface mount, which you can see from the, uh, the image here. The components all sit on top. Uh, they're actually almost entirely pick and placed by robots, which is increasingly essential because the components are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. I mean, they're tiny specks. You can have you know, micro LEDs that are well under a millimeter in diameter now. So how does this work in terms of prototyping? Well, most of the PCBs in the world are manufactured in China. 90% uh, are made in the APAC region, so other East Asian countries as well as China. Uh, but a lot of the design is actually done both in the States, in North America, and also in Europe. And so these designs are done as software. They're exported, if you like, sent by email across the world to China, where they're actually physically manufactured. So those are the red lines. Uh, and then the blue lines are the physical manufactured PCB being sent back to whoever it was who ordered it. Now, for prototyping, a lot of people find it's actually cheaper if they can withstand having to wait for as many as several weeks uh, to actually get uh, the Chinese to manufacture just the prototypes. And then you rarely get one board. You would typically buy at least a batch of 10 boards because it's just not, not cost effective to do that for a single board. And if you're a company that's uh, you know higher end professional and you've got the budget, then you can pay more money and have them just prototype locally. But it'll be some specialist service bureau, a kind of PCB print shop, if you like. And so what we're looking at in this presentation are some new technologies that give you the opportunity to prototype PCBs on your desktop. And the more exciting aspect is to get away from having flat PCBs. And so there are some interesting applications of that. So before I get into those, I'm just going to have a quick look mainly at the major players in this space. So first up here, we have an uh, Israeli company called Nano Dimension. They're bringing a 3D printer to market this year. It's a kind of a 3D printer, 2.5D printer maybe. So this is printing flat PCBs, but they're multi-layer PCBs. And it's got high resolution, so they can print really professional quality PCBs. At the bottom, we have Sarah Drop, who are a French company who've been manufacturing a variety of different electronic devices using 3D printing for many years now. Overleaf now, we have Optimec, who have an aerosol jet technology that lets them deposit conductive uh, and actually many other kinds of inks uh, remotely from significant standoff from the object. At the bottom, we have Neotech ANT, who are Germany-based. They are using the aerosol jet technology from Optimec, but they've done some very interesting R&D with it. And in fact, the results of their work have now been used to manufacture millions of mobile phone antennas. And you can see here they've actually got a circuit that they've built on top of an egg. Uh, here we have Pulse Electronics. So these guys are doing uh, extrusion of conductive inks. They're also doing mobile phone antennas. So it's competing technology with Optimax aerosol jet. And also, as I'll see in a minute, there are some other technologies that are competing with this as well. And at the bottom, we have a highly related. So this is some um, extrusion of uh, inks and pastes, which can be uh, cured photonically by Novacentrix. And Enscript are a company famous, I think, I would say, for bioprinting, actually, because they have incredible extrusion technology uh, and they're collaborating with Novacentrix to do some interesting stuff in the space of 3D printed electronics. We also have Voxel 8 which were a company announced in uh, January this year at CES. They've got this machine at the top right. It's like a regular sort of consumer level 3D printer in that it extrudes molten thermoplastic but it also extrudes uh, silver silver based viscoelastic paste that's highly conductive. And so they've used it to manufacture some interesting complete devices like the quadcopter at the bottom right-hand corner here. And here we have some images from uh, AGIC, Volterra, Cartesian Co, Bot Factory. And there are more and more companies coming into this space now. These are all smaller startups that they will undoubtedly make their mark in the future. So a quick look at materials. So at the top here, we have the possibility of extruding solder because that melts at a similar temperature to thermoplastics, which are used in low-end printers. At the bottom, we have uh, additives that can be added to regular thermoplastics to make them more conductive or make them conductive at all. Uh, graphene is one example of that. 
Here we have silver inks at the top and silver pastes at the bottom. These are both highly conductive, and these are options. So you can see at the top that AGIC has ink jetted the silver ink, and at the bottom that's an extruded silver paste by Voxel 8. What exactly is it people might accomplish using this? Well, uh, lots of different things. The sort of red uh, periodic shaped structure in the middle is actually a radio frequency lens. That's a metamaterial. Top right hand corner we have some interesting uh, applications with electrodes by Ceradrop. Bottom right hand corner out of Harvard University we have a 3D printed battery. Um, bottom in the middle there we have uh, complete structural electronics. So this is a hypothesis of what might happen in the future. Uh, conjecture or forecast by Xerox Park in California, and they're saying that potentially with this kind of technology we could integrate mechanical structural components with the electronics, so the electronics would actually live inside the structural components, the motors, everything could be built all at the same time. And at the bottom left hand corner, a much simpler but um, realizable uh, opportunity here in the short term is a Tesla torch. So this is a very simple 3D printed torch. Uh, if it was possible to print the electronics as well, it would be very easy to make a torch. That's actually one of the first demos people tend to come up with. So that's an example of low volume manufacturing. The challenge is, so here I've got some, uh, some interesting competing technologies. So CNC, bottom left hand corner, 6,000 pounds, a CNC mill by LPKF. A bottom right hand corner, we have LPKF's um, LDS, laser directed structuring technology, has been used by Festo to do a robot. In this case, it's a robotic ant which moves using piezo motors and has incredibly detailed electronics laid out across the surface of the body of the ant and the head of the ant, as you can see there. Various other challenges here. Conductive inks and paste are expensive. Obviously, silver is expensive. The conductivity is, is in many cases worse than silver foil, so there's still obviously a significant advantage to the incumbent technology. And conductive adhesives, so how do you actually stick the components down to your printed electronics? That remains a significant challenge, a materials challenge. So now I'll just briefly mention uh, some aspects of the economic side of this. What, what might this actually do to the market value and the market forecasts? Well, in 3D printing in 2012, there was a massive media frenzy with um, front page articles in Science Magazine, Design News, The Economist, and many, many other places talking about 3D printed objects and how 3D printing was going to revolutionize everything, uh, a third industrial revolution, and so on and so forth. This is quite likely to happen again in the context of 3D printed electronics. Most likely it's going to happen within the next year because there are so many new opportunities, so many new companies bringing products to market, uh, so much uh, information now going around about the potential of these kinds of technologies that I think it's quite likely that media will pick up on this. I don't think it's going to be a media frenzy the size of the 3D printing one that we saw in 2012, but I do think it will be big enough to thrust a lot of these major players into the limelight and many of these companies are already seeing major growth so uh, I'm sure the media will pick up on that as they have done in the context of general 3D printing. The market forecast here, so I'll just briefly mention obviously it's blotted out because the idea is that uh, you can buy the book and you can see the full detail of the market forecast. You can see at the bottom the five main sectors, home, education, professional, industry and then there's an other section of catch-all. And the scale on the left tells you that, roughly speaking, these all combine to form uh, at least a billion dollar market. So this is predominantly, this is um, equipment sales will be a billion dollars. It's likely uh, the material sales will match that. And this is really a lower limit. It's entirely possible the market could be a lot bigger than this. So if you're interested in all of this stuff, please do come and buy our report. There's information here on all of the separate pieces of uh, data in there, the chapters, everything that's covered. And if you're interested or curious, please do get in contact with me, John Harris. Thanks very much.